Studio Ghibli Renowned as arguably the greatest animation studio in the history of the genre, the Japanese-born studio founded by creators Hayao Miyazaki, Isao Takahara, and Toshio Suzuki. Since the studio's inception, these four gentlemen have gone on to deliver an almost infallible catalogue of pure art. You can't really call yourself an animation lover if you haven't treated your eyes and heart to the pleasure of a Ghibli movie. A body of work that spans almost four decades and 24 titles, exploring a diverse array of stories, themes, emotions, and characters. The wonderment of these films appeals to damn near everyone. There will most definitely be something, somewhere in these movies, that you'll find yourself connected to. And with that, we all naturally have our favorites. Our Ghibli tier lists. So through some curious investigation and maybe a little self-satisfaction, I went on a little expedition to see what other people's tier lists look like. And as expected, there was almost always a different movie at the top. But I started noticing a pattern, a regular member near the bottom of those lists, a victim of circumstance who I was shocked to see ranked so poorly. It was Tomomi Mochizuki's 1993 film, Ocean Waves. So I sat questioning myself, is Ocean Waves a bad movie? Is it actually the worst Ghibli movie? Treating myself to a rewatch, I continued to rattle my brain for the answer. And my answer was... No! So I'm here to fight for my love of this movie, to counteract the negative publicity, to encourage the uninitiated to watch, and finally, and most selfishly, to just tell you all how much this movie means to me. Directed by Tomomi Mochizuki and based on the Psycho Himuro novel of the same name, Ocean Waves follows the story of Taku Morisaki, a second year college student who's forced to look back on his senior year at high school as he makes his way to the class reunion. This tumultuous time in his life revolves primarily around the interactions with his dear friend Yutaka Matsuno and the girl who turned his life upside down, Rikako Muto. The setting of this obscure love story is the enchanting little seaside town of Kochi located on the smallest of Japan's islands, Shikoku. On a casual summer day, while Staku works away at his part-time job, he gets a vague call from Yutaka, asking him to meet at school. Upon his arrival at school, he's slightly underwhelmed to hear that all Yutaka wanted to show him was a new girl from Tokyo who was joining his class. He had just shown her around the school and was obviously infatuated. As the two chums walk through the halls of their empty school, Taku begins to recall how he first met Yutaka. On cancellation of their junior high school trip, both Taku and Yutaka bonded over their collective protest of the school's rash decision. And from that point onwards, Taku felt that his friendship with Yutaka was rather special compared to his other friends. In the wake of the new school term starting, we begin to witness the ripples of Rikako's arrival at their little country bumpkin school. Through no ill intention of her own, she sticks out like a sore thumb, excelling in sports, grades, and slightly hard to tell with animation, but even looks. Garnering unwanted attention from lusting boys and jealous girls, all whilst barely having a conversation with anyone but Yutaka. All the meanwhile, Yutaka seems to be getting closer and closer with Rikako. The previous year's cancelled school trip to Kyoto was now replaced with the trip to Hawaii. Not a bad compromise if you ask me. On their final day, as Taku relaxes, he's approached by Rikako for the first time. She pleads with him to borrow some money as she's lost all her own. With a bit of struggle and argument, Taku eventually submits and loans her some money. Months pass and Taku receives a distressing call from one of his classmates, Yumi. He's incensed to find out that Rikako lied to him about losing her holiday money and it was all just a ploy to rope her friend into coming with her on a surprise visit back to Tokyo to see her father, all at Taku's expense. Yumi begs him to come to the airport and help her get out of this. So, with just the clothes on his back and his chic retro jacket, God, I've wanted that jacket for so long, he sets off. On her high-spirited arrival back to her childhood home, she is bemused to find that her father has already moved on to another woman. Just when he thought he could finally relax, Rikako comes barging in and she's an emotional train wreck. After some trivial ranting from Rikako and Taku facing the impossible task of comforting her, she tuckers herself out and 
and they both rest for the night. Either Taku is just an unbelievably nice guy for putting up with all her shit, or he really does care about her. The next morning, even after some atrocious sleep, he's delighted to see that Rikako is back to her confident and blunt self as she gets ready to meet an old friend for coffee. In the meantime, we're treated to a wonderfully serene montage of Taku strolling around Tokyo. This film is chock full of these little moments, gorgeous landscape artwork that bolster the vibrance of the era. By the sea or in a busy city, I would give my left leg to spend a summer in 80s Japan. The friend Rikako was meeting was in fact her ex-boyfriend, and in the same vein as her father, he too has moved on to another girl. In her persisting state of anguish, she conjures up a foolishly childish scheme to call Taku down to act as her new boyfriend as a way to get even with her ex. But Taku, being a man of self-respect, and more importantly, a man who respects Rikako's true character, is having none of this. Word quickly spreads around the school about their trip to Tokyo, prompting Yutaka to inquire about it from Taku. Yutaka shares that after questioning Rikako about their trip, he confessed his love to her. In true Rikako fashion, she reacted explosively. Rejecting his confession in a manner so harsh and disrespectful that it broke Yutaka's heart and tanked his grades. Now, if you guys were watching the same movie I was, there was only one suitable reaction to come out of our boy Taku. You don't go around disrespecting his dearest friend and hope to get away with it, no matter who you are. <laughs> And in typical high school fashion, no matter how big the ordeal may be, life goes on. Rikako becomes as secluded as ever, prompting some of the other girls to confront her for her perceived superiority and lack of participation. Unfazed, Rikako stands her ground, with Taku coincidentally present to witness it all. After the other girls retreat, Rikako spots Taku and delivers yet another slap. And surprise, surprise, Yutaka shows up too, adding another bruise to decorate his face with her. The outcome of that debacle resulted in the crumbling of their friendship. And here's where we jump to the present. Taku arrives back in Kochi for the reunion, and who is he surprised to see pick him up from the airport? Matsuno. And so ensues my favorite scene of Ocean Waves. As the two catch up on the drive home, chatting away about their new lives as college students, time seems to fly by. They arrive at Taku's house, and with kindred humility, Yutaka apologizes for punching him way back when. Taku, just happy to be back with his friend, chuckles. The air being filled with the delight of friendship, the two decide to go for a stroll along the pier. Here, in the parade of the comforting score, the two get clarity on the emotions they felt in that boisterous time. The feelings they both shared for Rikako that tore them apart. And so we finally arrive at the class reunion, filled with laughs, embarrassing stories, and plenty of alcohol. The mature college students imbued with nostalgia and a broader perspective on life collectively reminisce on their shared past. Once their whole world, the quaint town of Kochi seemed ever so small. Taku misses Rikako, as she doesn't make it to the reunion. Whilst they wander through the town, Yumi tells him that she bumped into Rikako, and apparently she skipped the reunion to go back to Tokyo to see about a guy who likes to sleep in bathtubs. Now you might be thinking to yourself that this feels more like a young adult miniseries than a Studio Ghibli movie. And I totally get where you're coming from. I would have had the same thought during my first viewing. If it wasn't for my fondness for the slice of life genre and other similar works from the studio like Only Yesterday and Whisper of the Heart, I might have been more than a little confused, possibly even disappointed by Ocean Waves. But in my exploration of the slice of life genre, I've discovered one crucial thing. Just because it's based on the real world, with real interactions and real people, doesn't make it any less magical. It's about finding the extraordinary in the ordinary, you see? The animation, score, and dialogue all come together to produce a story that still has that charmed Ghibli quality, just delivered in a slightly different manner. Let me explain. I've struggled for about an hour trying to put into words what the animation of Ocean Waves makes me feel, and yet I know I'm hardly going to scratch the surface of what it invokes in me. It bolsters such individuality in its art style, yet still championing that signature Ghibli and retro aura. The animation of Ocean Waves has carved out its own little cult following among AMV fans of 80s and 90s anime. It's the perfect reference for that infectious tranquility delivered by that era of animation. The seaside town of Kochi serves as an exquisite canvas for this enchanting tale. The picturesque coastal charm translates effortlessly to animation. The vibrance in which the town is animated has me basking in the Japanese summer heat alongside our characters. 
The way it makes me nostalgic of those childhood summers spent in the sun, not a care in the world, is indescribable. Every frame captures the spirit of this town brimming with life, from the gentle motion of the clouds to the shimmering reflections on the water's surface. Kochi becomes more than just a setting. It becomes a character in itself, given its own unique charisma and allure, drawing me even deeper into the captivating world of ocean waves. The team of animators under Mochizuki's command were primarily composed of individuals in their early 20s. The advantage they had in just having exited that juvenile era in their lives allowed them to invigorate each frame with adolescence, reflecting a time in our lives where everything seems more vibrant. Along with the absolutely breathtaking landscape artwork of Kochi, Hawaii, and Tokyo, I noticed a strong commitment to framing the scenes as if an actual camera was used, with all shots being stationary and the use of lens blurs and focuses. All continued efforts to ground our story firmly in reality. There clearly wasn't an intention in trying to nudge our imaginations with unrealistic visuals. The magic of animation lies in its ability to infuse the real world with enchantment. They left it up to us, the viewer, to appreciate the wonders of everyday life that constantly surround us, especially in our youth. Composed by Shigeru Nagata, a familiar collaborator of Mochizuki, Ocean Wave soundtrack is filled with brass instruments, maracas, synths, woodwinds, and of course the Ghibli favorites, piano and violin. All ideal instruments to convey the place and time our story is set in. You've got the immature whimsy of first impressions as it plays over the fawning boys, Then there's a homesick girl thrilled on her arrival back to her childhood city with On a Sunny Day. <laughs> and of course, my personal favorite, The Ocean Waves, which dances over fond memories of cherished friendship. Shigeru's heavy use of woodwind instruments has me daydreaming of lying on the hot sands with a sun hat over my eyes and a conch whispering in my ear with these exact melodies. He also adds a retro flair with the use of synths, being a fun reference to Japanese city pop tunes of that era. If you haven't gone down the rabbit hole of Japanese city pop yet, you are missing out, buddy. The sound design is not to be overlooked either. You're constantly being delighted by either buzzing insects of summer or the gentle crashing of waves in the distance. With all of it, the music, the sounds, you're totally transported. Now onto a very, very biased point to why I adore this movie. It's that in my opinion, it personifies nostalgia to a T. Admittedly, I am sort of the melancholic type. I'm addicted to that feeling of reminiscing on better days. Whether that's considered healthy is not a question for today, but what can I say? I love a good cry. Ocean Waves has me reliving the sweet days of my angsty youth along with vicariously missing rural Japan of the 80s somehow. And I've never even been to Japan. But as I've come to learn, that's not at all an uncommon feeling. Have you ever felt nostalgic over memories that aren't your own? Places you've never been or decades far past your era? Well, there's a word for that. Animoya. To have nostalgia for a time you've never known. I chase that high of Animoya whenever I watch Slice of Life anime, and very few things have hit me quite as hard as Ocean Waves. The original Japanese title of Ocean Waves actually translates to I can hear the sea, and to me it encapsulates a profound sentiment. It speaks of the strong connection the youth of Kochi hold with their hometown. Even when far from its shores, in those solitary moments nostalgia washes over them so intensely that they can almost hear the melody of the sea, a reminder of the unbreakable bond they share with their coastal roots. Even though it's not been that long since Taku's high school days, even a single year of college can cause you to mature rapidly. I'm speaking from experience here. The independence, responsibilities and freedom are wonderful, don't get me wrong, but they also have you missing home. In those first couple weeks, you lay alone late at night, staring blankly at your ceiling allowing the realization to settle that those carefree, reckless days are behind you. Now that I've advocated for ocean waves with all my affections, it's time to tackle why it gets so much negative publicity. Firstly, the argument that it lacks that token ghibliness. The mistake many people make when judging this movie is death by comparison. Most people, including myself, have only watched ocean waves due to the fact that it had that chubby Totoro slap on the front of it. And if you've been watching the fantastical worlds of Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, or even Porco Rosso, this one might feel a tad dull in comparison. But hold up, that's not quite fair. Ocean Waves is slice of life, remember. Not exactly what Ghibli's famous for. Sure, you've got flicks like Only Yesterday and Whisper of the Heart that might outshine it, but Ocean Waves still deserves some praise for what it brings to the table. 
Oh, so it didn't give you exactly what you expected. Big whoop. Secondly, the argument that its main characters are annoying, dull, and unlikable. They're pointing the finger at you, Rikako. Rikako's dealing with a whole lot of change in our story. And let's face it, who wouldn't struggle with being uprooted like that? Parents divorce, moving towns, switching schools, leaving friends behind, being picked on. It's a whirlwind of adjustment. And then there's her old room, her old friends, all different now. To top it off, her dad's moved on, diving into other relationships like it's nothing. It's like her whole life's been turned upside down, and that night in the hotel with Taku, that's her breaking point. Sure, it might seem a bit melodramatic, but considering everything she's gone through, it's no surprise she's feeling overwhelmed. Add the fact that her period just started, and it's like her emotions are on overdrive, swinging from happy one moment to none of your business the next. She's so brash in her polite, cute little voice. I feel for Taku. It's pretty infuriating at times the way she speaks to him. Rikako's defense mechanism is to be mean, like literally every angsty teen to ever exist. Think about yourself for a moment. You didn't lash out at parents, friends, teachers when they gave you shit. People might not like to admit it, but Rikako's not far off how we all would have acted if we'd gone through all that. Shit. I'd throw a fit if my mom tried fixing my meticulously curated hairstyle. Just goes to show, the troubles of youth can feel like the end of the world when you're in the thick of it. Ocean Waves gets all my credit for blending the ups and downs of teenage life wonderfully. I know it seems like I'm defending this movie with my life. And I am, because I like it. But in no way is my intention to say that it's a perfect movie. Neither to say it's one of the best Ghibli movies. I just want to show my love for a film that's been historically trounced on to reveal its merits, to encourage people to watch it, and to persuade those who didn't enjoy it to consider giving it another go. Despite presenting itself as a narrative focused on the seemingly trivial dramas of teenage life, this film is deceivingly deep, exploring themes of love, friendship, and growing up. It also has a funny self-awareness of how people might potentially mislabel this film. For starters, there's your love triangle. Well, that's a bit reductive. There's more dimensions to it than that, so it's closer to a love pyramid, I guess. While on the surface, it's obvious to see that Yutika is smitten for Rikako from the moment he first laid eyes on her, it's Taku who unexpectedly finds himself falling in love with her as they share various escapades. Despite harboring these feelings, Taku suppresses them out of respect for his friendship with Yutika. Only when the two reconcile do we get our happy ending, with Taku and Rikako reuniting against the backdrop of the track, First Impressions. The perfect theme for a renewed encounter imbued with the maturity of adulthood. But, but, big but here. As many viewers of Ocean Waves have pointed out, and the uber viral video by Elikarish perfectly decomposes, it doesn't always seem that Taku and Rikako are the ones falling in love in this movie, but more subtly, a tale of romance between Yutaka and Taku. Hence, love pyramid. Now, there's no wrong answers here, let's preface that. So continuing with the heavily biased and opinionated nature of this video, I'm gonna attempt to explain to you all my interpretations of some of the pivotal scenes of Ocean Waves. Let me know in the comments if you had the same conclusions I did, or likely if not, I'd love to hear your take. Let's start with the first interaction between our boys. When Yutaka calls Taku to meet, he doesn't tell him to drop everything at once and rush over. He kindly mentions meeting up after work. Nevertheless, Taku rushes to meet him. Perhaps it's partly due to the boredom of his workday, craving any excuse for a change of scenery, but I'd argue it's as simple as Taku wants to see his best friend. A great intro, I might add, to highlight the bond between these two. Later, after briefly meeting Rikako for the first time, Taku feels unreasonably irritated by Yutaka's interest in her. However, he dismisses it, attributing his annoyance to the belief that Yutaka will get rejected, as girls only go for looks and he doubts she'll see his true value. Doesn't seem like an unreasonable irritation a good friend would have, right? Guy's got his back. So maybe he's questioning something else about himself. Perhaps he's touching on aspects of his own identity. Aspects he hasn't fully come to terms with yet, like his sexuality. Then there's the other call he receives from Yutaka. He doesn't seem at all interested in Yutaka making advances on Rikako, giving stale replies while he fidgets with his slippers to the otherwise ecstatic Yutaka. Now there's two sources of Taku's jealousy here. Either he's not fond of hearing the guy he likes fawn over someone else, or on the flip side, he's unsettled by Yutaka's attempts to woo the girl that he has feelings for. Their love isn't just one-sided. Take Yutaka's sort of date with Rikako. He defaults to what he knows best, Taku. There's a litany of intimate moments between Taku and Yutaka sprinkled across this film, some more romantic in nature and others highlighting their brotherhood. But let's not close the door on Rikako just yet. There's plenty to break down between her and Taku too. 
While it may seem that all they do is butt heads for the entire movie, excluding the hug and the ending, there is method to Taku's madness. Something must explain why he keeps helping this girl. Let's attribute a portion of it to just physical attraction. He finds her pretty. But on a deeper level, Taku admires how true to herself Rikako is. He genuinely loves that blunt and obtuse side of her. The clearest evidence of this is when he labels her a bore for acting all goody-goody with her ex. He's genuinely infuriated when she attempts to impress him with this charade. When they talk after the whole incident, Rikako explains that she wasn't shocked because he moved on to another girl, but more so because he wasn't anything like she remembered. Everything has changed from her old life in Tokyo, and I think here she realizes there is no going back to it. In the scene where Taku wanders through Tokyo, the frame captures a building under construction before cutting to Rikako. As she appears on screen, we're reminded that she's in the midst of her own journey of growth and self-discovery. She grasps the need to move on in her life, and not to allow the past to bother her anymore. Even Taku says that it seems she grew up in that half an hour. There's also a strong argument to be made for Rikako's feelings towards Taku. While it may initially appear that she's simply using him, after that moment of maturity she gets clarity. It's in this moment that she recognizes Taku's genuine care for her. His unwavering support regardless of her mood, his willingness to call her out on her insincerity, and his loyalty and kindness when he stands up to her for mistreating Yutaka. Who wouldn't love a guy with that kind of character? When Taku doesn't help her when she's ambushed by those other girls, her anger mirrors his back in Tokyo. This boy who she's always known to be valiant, truthful, and outspoken for the things and people he cares about, just stood there. She slaps him for good measure, partly because he wasn't being true to himself, but more so for the hurt she feels of knowing that maybe Taku doesn't care about her anymore. And the same lesson of posturing is hammered home with that sweet left hook from Yutaka. Taku's reason not to intervene was for the sole purpose of his best friend's feelings. Another entanglement with Rikako could potentially lead to damaging his friendship with Yutaka beyond repair. And in that moment on the pier, Yutaka finally figured that out. His apology to Taku is heartfelt. He was standing in the way of his friend's genuine feelings for the girl they both loved. It makes no difference to me who Taku is attracted to. I think people are missing the point. The common denominator in all these interactions is love. Ocean Waves offers a nuanced approach to this theme, curating it so that the viewer can find themselves in the narrative, to navigate the unspoken complexities on their own. Ocean Waves is a smart movie. With each viewing at different stages of my life, I always seem to uncover something new. Finally, let's talk about the infamous Kochi Castle scene. As I've seen from many videos and posts about Ocean Waves, this one really threw people for a loop. You have the coalescence of a smiling Taku, slow sentimental music, and the crass recollection of all the sour words from Rikako. Now I'll admit it, on first watch I was a little dumbfounded. Like did the director really think this is what a romantic montage looks like? But then it hit me. Taku's initial thought when looking at the castle was that he always thought lighting up Kochi Castle was a waste of electricity. But now, he wishes he could enjoy its beauty with Rikako by his side. This touching metaphor for lighting up the past is Taku's shift of perspective. Despite the hardships of Rikako, he looks back on that turbulent time fondly and appreciates their shared history for what it is. And we know he's not alone in this feeling. Rikako's search for the guy who likes to sleep in bathtubs means she's had her Kochi Castle moment too. And with that closure, he's able to clear the ambiguity of the girl standing on the opposite side of the platform and race his way to her. Like Shimizu says at the bar, the problem when you're little is that your world is too small. The little inconveniences that happen can feel like the end of the world. For those who say the character motivations in this film are confusing, it's because they are. A purposeful detail in my opinion to tell a story about the most confusing time in a person's life, being a teenager. Ocean Waves is a superb Studio Ghibli movie. All my respect goes to Tomomi Mochizuki for not crumbling under the weight of expectations. This wasn't some cheap emulation of Isao Takahara or Hayao Miyazaki, he came in to make something that he and the young team wanted to make. And regardless of the feedback, they should all be extremely proud of what they achieved. I love this movie. In my opinion, it's timeless, because adolescence will never be devoid of such frantic and melodramatic struggles, and maturity will most certainly never be devoid a fondness for one's past. Life is just like learning about how to let go about stuff. Because like you really can't enjoy things for what they are while you're in it. Like as soon as you're in high school, once you're like, oh, I get high school, you're out of high school. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Apologies if it was a little messy. The main goal here was just to try chuck everything I love about ocean waves and hope it stuck. If you like this, then I've got some other anime focused videos on my channel too. So make sure to like, subscribe, and as always, appreciate you watching.